Hello everyone, my name is Mirvat al Asnaj. I'm an interventional cardiologist in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and we're here today with episode number two of Statistics 101 with CCI Catheterization and Cardiovascular Interventions Journal. We'll be discussing an article that was published in August of this year, Cerebral Embolic Protection and Severity of Stroke Following Transcatheter Aortic Valve Replacement. And with me today is a fantastic faculty consisting of Samir Kapadia. He's the senior author, Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, Heart Vascular and Thoracic Institute, Cleveland Clinic, Cleveland, Ohio. And of course, our Editor-in-Chief, Stephen Bailey, Shreveport, Louisiana. And our um, statistical and analysts, Jan Tyson, Amsterdam, uh, Netherlands. Hello, everybody. Hello, everyone. Hi, good afternoon. So, Samir, could you briefly describe the methodology and most important results of this study? Yeah, so what we tried to do was to say that uh, if you use a cerebral protection device, do we reduce the stroke and the severity of stroke? The only way to analyze this was to systematically uh, look at the population before we had the central device available and then after the central device available. Since these two populations are different, we had to somehow match them, somehow eliminate the differences between the two populations to say, that really it was the change in population that decreased the stroke, or was it actually the central device that decreased the stroke? And since it's not a randomized trial, it's a retrospective study, what we employed is this propensity matching method, which is slightly different than what we generally use for just propensity matching. Mm -hmm. So I'll just describe it. I'll share my screen with you uh, for a couple of slides. Uh, if you can uh, just uh, enable me uh, to share the screen. But the idea is that uh, when you have a, uh, when you want to look at the uh, statistics, uh, it's fairly straightforward that in the propensity matching, we take the covariates, we select, we create a propensity score. What is a propensity score is to say that what is the probability of an individual patient to get the treatment. So by the, by the covariates, you decide that a gender, diabetes, whatever, if these are your covariates, what is your chance to be in the control group or what is your chance to be in the treatment group? And that would be your probability or propensity score. And then you match the propensity score by the calipers that you decide that this is the extent of uh, allowance you are able to give uh, to the propensity score. Now, what is the inverse uh, probability treatment weighing is to say, that we take the propensity score and put as a one divided by propensity score. And then we say that what is your exposure rate or non-exposure rate? I have an example here. So if you say that if you have an original sample, the rate would be high risk patients, one would be low risk patients. And these are the people who are control group and these are say the people with uh, sentinel group. Now there are three high risk patients or Two thirds of the three fourths of the patients were high risk. And now you can calculate to say that if you give them a weight and you say that now you want to create a population such that in both groups, the red and the white are similar, then you will give them a. I, I wrote it down here how you will calculate, but you will calculate the inverse weight to say that this red group should be 1.33 times and the white group should be four times. Here, the red group will be four times and the white group will be 1.33 times. So now if you compare it, both sides would have four, four of each group. And this is the, and you will study the outcomes of these patients now in a, uh, in a comparable group of patients. The disadvantage of this is that if you have extreme risks, so like if you go to the sites where you have very few patients, then you will have a very high weight. So we exclude those patients. What is the advantage of this versus the regular propensity matching is that you don't eliminate the patients altogether. And so you have a sample size that is larger and you can use it in categorical and continuous variable. I would not go to the last part because it's not, not so relevant in this particular study, but if the, if the treatment is not exactly at the, at the same time and there's a longitudinal part that you have to study, then you can also study that. In some studies, hazard ratios are better predicted by this method compared to the other 
methods. So this is the reasons why we use this particular method in this study. Well, thank you, Samir. So Jan, I'll turn to you. Um, do inverse weighting and propensity analysis sufficiently control for differences compared with um, multivariate analysis for confounders, for example? Well, the randomized trial addicts will say no, because uh, you need randomization uh, to do that. But that's not a fair answer here. But there is a tinge of truth in, in, in that answer. So whether the method adequately um, adjust for differences in rates depends very much on the quality of the data in the database. And in this example, whether a, if this would be a, a contemporary uh, series of uh, interventions, then you might expect that the treating physician, the cardiologist who does the, uh, who takes the decision about, who does the uh, the, TAVR, uh, implant, the TAVR procedure, uh, will use the device in patients of whom he surmises that they are at a high risk for a stroke. And uh, he won't use, the, he or she won't use the device in patients for, with a low risk for stroke. If in that situation you want to compensate for the clinical intuition uh, of the of the treating physician whether or not to use the device that really depends on whether the clinical intuition is captured in the baseline data and whether the baseline data are in the uh, in the in the, in the database so for instance a database purely derived from uh, from TAVR procedures probably has much more detail than an administrative or a claims database. So there is a big difference there about the quality of the data. And then there is the final discussion always whether quantitative variables in a database capture the intuition, or in German you would say fingerspitzengefühl of the clinic of the clinician who takes a decision. If you have a contemporary disjunct, so first before the introduction of the device and later the introduction of the device, in the first period, none of the patients has, has the protection device. In the second period, all of the patients have the, the, the uh, protection device. You, don't, you, have, you have less problems with that. But then again, in two years' time, four years' time, the tougher techniques and maybe the skills of the of the physicians might have changed. So in principle, yes, but it's um, it's um, hierarchically uh, less le less good, of course, than randomization because randomization is the ultimate tool to remove a selection of the patient for the favored treatment by the clinician from the uh, from the comparison. So Stephen, I'll turn to you and both as a clinician and an editor in chief, do you refer every manuscript to a statistician? So in this particular study, what exactly did you want your statistician to tell you? Yeah, so I think that many studies uh, have statistics that are relatively straightforward that uh, as clinicians we're used to and capable of evaluating. Um, so for those, I think if, if we feel comfortable that we don't, I think increasingly, however, as shown in this particular example, uh, as we begin to try to answer questions that can't be answered yet in randomized trials or may not ever be randomizable, that having someone who is uh, skilled not only in statistical analysis, but understanding cardiovascular disease has really been critically important. And so, you know, with somebody like Jan, where we really can ask them to help us understand, as we saw that beautifully illustrated weighting model, which you know is very simple, I could understand that one, uh, but as we're going through the data sets here, uh, is this propensity weighting correctly weighted? Yeah. Uh, you know, was the IPTW done correctly? Is the data uh, coming uh, from a database that should be uh, valuable? I think all of those are better answered by a statistician and give us comfort as clinicians that 
we can then begin to take that information and apply it in our clinic and yeah. in our clinical practice. So I'll turn back to the statistician. So yeah. Yeah, what conclusions can be drawn when the primary endpoint is negative and there's only a small numerical difference in the secondary endpoint, as we saw here with respect to um, you know debilitating stroke? Um, that problem is not fundamentally different in, in observational comparison as and, and, and the randomized comparison. As we have seen in the randomized trial, the data are almost exactly the same. In a randomized trial, you have this formal hierarchical testing where you have a predefined protocol. Um, and the New England Journal of Medicine is very critical about it. I was at a conference in Washington last week where a lot of clinicians, had, and I agree with them to a certain extent, had a lot of criticism about whether a secondary endpoint follows a non, uh, whether the second secondary endpoint follows a non statistically significant uh, endpoint, uh, and therefore can't. The, the p-value cannot be published and cannot be used. That's probably good in the situation where, where the FDA has to decide which indications or which effects come on the label. With the clinical interpretation of a manuscript, I think we ought to be much more liberal and um, uh, whether um, the classical example is the Plato trial where um, Ticagrelor had a positive effect on, 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 on mortality. It was a discussion and lawyers played an important role in it about the label, not about we as clinicians and statisticians who know a little bit about clinics believe that this drug has an effect on, uh, on, on mortality. So every trial. So the hierarchy in an observational study, the hierarchy uh, is, I think, less important. Of course, the data should enforce each other, and uh, but that's not different from an observational study from a randomized study. The number of patients with an event is 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 very important, and as far as I'm concerned, that's the Achilles heel of of of, of this publication. So every trial comes with limitations, um, and and so uh, perhaps Samir, we can come back to you just just in a minute. But um, you know there are limitations with any trial, and in this trial, the number of patients with stroke in the overall population was small, making it underpowered to examine differences in the rank and scale, for example, between those with and without embolic protection. And also the baseline neurologic evaluations weren't available for all patients. So how important is that to you, Stephen, as an editor, um, when it comes to determining suitability for publication? So the two criteria I think that uh, I look for as a journal uh, are novelty. Is there other information that gives us the same or, or more than this particular manuscript might? And how important is it in clinical practice? This particular case, there really wasn't a better data set of individuals. I think it informed us about what future trials might need to be powered at if they're looking at similar patient populations. Uh, and it's novel and clinically important because we really don't have very definitive, very focused evaluations. So those are the criteria that I use. Will it help? Uh, those of us doing interventional cardiology and reading from CCI, and does it move us forward in asking the next question and asking how we care for patients? Absolutely. And some I think it is important to turn back to you. Um, in, you know, in, the, in the manuscripts, the authors conclude that embolic protection use may lie in the effect of attenuation of the severity of stroke, but you do recommend larger um, prospective trials to address this hypothesis following TABR. So if you were to design another trial to address that point specifically, how would you do it? And, and what is your practice when it comes to embolic protection now, based on your study? Right, right. So these are both very good questions. So the first and foremost is that when you are trying to advance the clinical science of any kind, in this particular case, the embolic protection, the most important question is that 
people who are doing this for in the, at a at the highest level, doing it with a lot of care, a little bit of bias of the operator to try to understand that what exactly is happening, not bias in terms of using the device, but bias in terms of seeing the results, that if you are, if I'm convinced that there is a decrease in the major strokes, after seeing the data, after seeing my clinical practice, and after evaluating it with very good neurologists, then I personally think it is worth the publication to understand, share with people that, listen, this is what we found. It does not mean that I'm saying that, hey, listen, you use it in all the patients, but at least we are using it in our patients and this is what we have found and we find it helpful. Now, generate the next question that how do we design a trial? Obviously, we have to design a trial with a primary endpoint of major stroke. When we came up with this study design, we needed 8,000 patients because the stroke rate is coming down. Now, is it feasible? Are we going to be able to, so we went to the TBT registry, said that, okay, we want to do a pragmatic trial. Maybe it's cost neutral. Now, remember the TAVR trials for a, approval of the TAVR valve is done with 1,000 patients. Now we are talking about an ancillary device which is just to prevent the stroke. And we want to do 8,000 patient trial in Chavo, uh, with, you know, and, and the device is approved. So who is going to fund this trial? Who is going to spend this kind of money for you know, relatively less important financial gain? Now, remember the financial gain is one part, but the, for the patient, having a stroke is a major mass, yeah. major. So it is my responsibility and other people's responsibility to say that, okay, we are going to try to collect as much data as possible to inform people and then let people decide whatever is the best way to. So an honest representation of data, in my opinion, has value before statistical adjustment. So I think that if you just show that 1,500 1, patients before Sentinel use, 1,500 after Sentinel use, stroke rate decrease. We didn't see major stroke. In my mind, that's enough. Then you are just a statistic. You represent the data in the most academically uh, you know, desirable way and then conclude that this is what we are doing and you decide what you want to do. This is the way I, we packaged the information as a responsible uh, cardiologist. Uh, to say that this is what we want to just convey to the board. Well, thank you everybody for being with us. And uh, this was certainly engaging and it's an important trial because we really haven't had a lot on cerebral embolic devices in um, TAVR procedures. So thank you and stay tuned for another episode of CCI Statistics 101.